Dear, <clears throat> dear ladies and gentlemen, please have a seat. Who are we as humans? How do we want all to live together? How can we ensure the well being of humankind and a sustainable future of our planet? These questions were at the heart of the two exciting days, rich of passionate debates, projecting ourselves in the future and anticipating the development in the fields of science in diplomacy in the next five, 10, <clears throat> 25 years from now. It is a pleasure to welcome you already for the final closing session of this very first Geneva Science and Diplomacy Anticipation Summit. Thank you for being with us today here in person and online. My name is Ninian Pafkin. I am the managing director of the Swiss Digital Initiative Foundation, a foundation based here in Geneva with the aim to promote digital ethics. And I will be your master of ceremony today. And we will start with a very exciting topic, the future of the cities. Because the last two days have shown the complexity of anticipating the future, and one of the complex topics that were covered and are also at the heart of the question, how do we want to live together, are the future, are, to, excuse me, <laughs> are the cities, their composition, services, and digital infrastructures. Cities are at the forefront of people's concrete concerns, for example, in terms of digit digitalization and climate change. So the question we would like to discuss today um, is how can science help cities and their leaders to address the concrete concerns for their residents? And I'm very honored and pleased to have such distinguished guests with us today. Um, so uh, please welcome Maimuna Mod Sharif. She is um, the executive director of UN Habitat in Malaysia. Um, warm welcome to you, um, Maimuno. It's a pleasure to have you here with us in Geneva. Then so we have with us as well um, uh, Sami Kanao. He is the president of the Geneva Cities Hub and also the president of the Swiss Youth Commission and a former mayor of Geneva. Warm welcome to you as well, Sami. But before we start the conversation, we will have a look, an inspirational video on what a complex system looks like. <clears throat> Thank you. 
So, as we have seen, each city can also be considered as an example of such a complex <coughs> system. <laughs> so, dear um, Maimuna, my question to you, no, no worries. How can the data collected and the models they feed be useful to better manage cities? So we have seen technologies will change um, the face of the cities, how cities uh, will be perceived. So how can we use data to make the lives of citizens better? Thank you very much uh, for having me here. A very good uh, 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 five minutes to, to 12 noon afternoon to all of you. Um, I'm so sorry because I'm rushing from, uh, from the airport to have my PCR test. So <laughs> quickly, I need to have a, you know, it's very dry in my throat. Uh, so, um, well, so managed to get some uh, plain water uh, while waiting for the uh, for this session. I'm very happy to be here. And, and I would like to answer this uh, question in uh, from two perspective. One, I'm an urban planner. I came from the village with no water, no electricity at that time in the, in, in the, in the sixties. Yeah. So you know how old I am uh, in the sixties, no water, no electricity, no telephone. Don't talk about handphone or, or uh, cable phone. And then uh, as a urban planner, I, I, I studied in England and then as a mayor for seven years in Penang, um, Malaysia, and now as an EDO inhabitant. So I will answer this question from the, my experience as a mayor and also experience as the uh, executive director. So let's get some uh, statistic here. People used to say that cities is the engine of growth because it's contribute to 70% of the global GDP. Cities is also where the people go. By 2050, 70% of the global population will live in city. City is also where we consume about 70% of the energy. It's also 70% the emit carbon emission. Cities is also an innovation hub for science, for art, for heritage, and for culture. And cities is also center for talent. Yeah. And cities is for the people. I believe that and people is for the city. So this is very, very important. I think the, the, the aspect, the background and the framework that we want to talk about digitalization. So science and digitalization or digital technologies, I would like to put it into two aspects. One is the hardware, one is the software. Hardware is about equipment, about digital equipment, digital facilities. But the software is that the people, the people in the cities, in terms of the capacity building, in terms of the training, in terms of the knowledge to use that science has given to us. So from the perspective of a mayor, even though we have the data, we have the science, analysis or science uh, 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 findings or, or new innovation, but without the knowledge at the local level, without the capacity to absorb, to analyze, to implement, to manage and to maintain, then science will be nothing. So I think this is very important to clean the software and the hardware together. Second, about digitalization, it will help Yes, but you know that it's half of the world is offline. So we have to, half of the world population is offline. So we need to look into the, the balance between the North and the South, the, the least developed country to developed country. Then now I'm speaking as an EDO and have that to see that how we can put together. Digitalization, COVID-19, I think is already is uh, proven that those cities who are digitalized, those cities have the digital equipment. Those cities has uh, the, the GIS uh, being linked to the, to, the, to, to the collection of revenue. They can function because many of the, the, the function now, the function and the role of the cities is changed from the, from the old norm to the new norm or, or on the technology. But those cities without digitalization, without internet, without the technology, they, 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 they suffer in terms of the revenue. They suffer the, the cripple in terms of the function. So I think this is very, very important for us to look into the complexity. Science, data is one thing, but it's the implementation and to bring the, 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 the technology to the cities in terms of the demand drive, not supply drive. I think this is very important to look into the 
engagement of the people to show that where data and where digitalization in the complex environment of cities for people, for housing, for mobility, for education, for industry, agriculture, tourism, art and culture, you, you name it. I think this is very, very important. My message is that we have to engage the people. We have to work together with the people in terms of the vertical and horizontal integration. What I mean is that vertical is from the global, national, regional, and the local is the community, private sector, and, and, and the indigenous people, mm -hmm. and all those, those community leaders to provide them a, a place to work, live, and play. So I stop there. Thank you so much. <laughs> Thank you, Maimuna, um, for this very rich um, answer. So you mentioned and you stressed it many times, and we talked over and over over the two year, uh, previous days. Um, how can we include the citizens? Because they are at the heart of the cities, of course, but also when it comes to technological change, this is only possible when people are part of the transformation and drive and shape this transformation. How can we ensure the participation and the inclusion of the citizens truly in this conversation? Yes, a big challenge, but it's absolutely necessary. I mean, first of all, thank you for giving me the floor. I am former mayor, but I'm still a member of the local government of the city of Geneva. So I really live day by day, you know, the challenge of being a member of a local government. And I choose to be in charge since more than one year of digital transition for the city, among other filings I'm in charge of. And I would like to quote somebody who was famous, passed away in 2017, Benjamin Barber. You probably know it, a very famous blogger, essayist, writer in the United States. His famous book, Dysfunctioning States, Rising Cities. If the mayors rule the world, the world would be better. So obviously the mayors are not perfect at all, but cities are always at the forefront of day-to-day -day reality. They can't cheat. It's daily life of citizens. Whenever about migration, climate change, social inequalities, digital issues, daily life, the pandemic has shown it. The cities are at the last institution level but the first actually um, person, I mean, entity you, you speak of when dealing with, with day -to -day daily issues and challenges and problems. And it's still, it's progressing, but still the international community is not recognizing the important role of local governments in general, uh, because they are part of the state. So the national states tend to say, we are speaking also in the name of the local governments. Fortunately, the cooperation has been increasing a lot. You have international networks, and I really would uh, congratulate you on Habitat because you are our lawyer and advocate. You make an advocacy for uh, mm -hmm. urbanization in general, but also for local government within the UN system, the international community. And this is absolutely crucial. You have the international network, your CLG, United Cities and local governments. And our framework, we know it. Within the SDGs, all SDGs are crucial, but we have a specific SDG number 11, making cities and human settlements more resilient, sustainable, and and uh, inclusive for all populations. It sounds good, but city life, I mean, Geneva is a privileged city. We are a small city. If you look at the major cities in the world and Benjamin Barber was insisting, we need more local democracy. We need definitely more and more local democracy. And as my Muna Sharif said, uh, digitalization is a very powerful tool, but if within the city of Geneva, the rich city of Geneva, we also have people who are not connected or who do not understand how to deal with that. And so we don't have to add a digital divide to the social divide or economic divide. And so it's an opportunity if we make it very inclusive and do it as a very transparent and ethical tool. So science can help us bring more understanding, more mutual understanding, more awareness, as long as we take all people together. And that's the daily life of a city, but it's obviously difficult. So I'm happy, that's why we created the Geneva Cities Hub to finish with that, is that it was a platform in Geneva to connect the world of cities and local governments and the networks with the international community in Geneva. And very looking forward also to cooperate between JESDA and Cities Hub, because JESDA is really showing us very clear, you see on the walls, what happens to us in five, 10, 25 years. And we as local government, we need that in an understandable way for daily life and all our citizens. Thank you. Thank you, Sami. So, um... You just mentioned it. So Chester is looking 5, 10, 25 years ahead. 
what will happen and you just said it cities are at the forefront of the changes so in a very brief statement um, probably from both of you let's do a short exercise in, with regard to the cities what will happen or how will for example geneva or um, malaysia transform in the next five ten twenty five years in a nutshell challenge <laughs> accepted <laughs> right my Muna. It's so difficult question to answer. <laughs> <laughs> well, as a planner, but we, we plan. Yeah, we plan. I think the most important thing is that we have the tools now. We have the tools, we have the innovation, we have the people. But what we need is that we have the plan. What we need is that we need the implementation plan. The action, the agreement of action. I think that's why we need a new social contract to see how the, the public services, I think COVID-19 has shown our weaknesses. So do we want to repeat or to stay tuned like is it now or you want to change? I think the COVID-19 give us an opportunity to look into the new design, new way of thinking, new way of uh, the, uh, looking at the function and the form of the cities and also an, a new way of looking at the leaders so that the, the leaders have to walk their talk because it's the the, the Paris Agreement is so long. We knew about the agenda in the 2016, but I'm, 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 I would like to share with you, even up to now, it's only 52 countries submit the report of the implementation of the new urban agenda. So what future are you talking about? If, if the, 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 all the, 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 um, the, uh, um, the, the agreement that we, the resolution that we have is not, is not implemented implemented locally, uh, I mean, it's true that, as I mentioned just now, the vertical and the horizontal uh, alignment uh, with the community. I think this is, the, I, I find that it's not to be, to be, I want to be a very optimistic. You see, it's optimistic. It's, there is a hope, there is a, a people, but we would like to do it together. I would like to end with that. We have to think together. We have to do together. We have to partner together. And then at the end of the day, the, be the, the, the best practices and the challenges we have to share. So think, do, partner, and share. And another one I would like to say is that I would like to, 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 to ask what always mentioned about my four P's. <laughs> Public, private, people partnership. If you want to implement whatever the, the, the resolution or the agreement. And I would like to say that think local, meaning you have to know your, your situation at local level, act global, learn global, then apply local. Thank you so much. <laughs> <laughs> so you already, um, yeah, summarized actually the, the, also the mission of CHEST, I would say. So in a nutshell. Yes, no. <laughs> in a nutshell, thank I you. Agree. <laughs> you promise. I, I really, From your perspective. I fully agree with Maimouna Mohamed al Sharif. I would like to add, we need a better recognition of local governments by yeah. the upper levels, national, international. It's not yet the case. I mean, it's definitely a crucial partner. Even Jezda had put it on the edge on the mm -hmm. civil society. Mm -hmm. That's not correct. We're not just civil society. We need to recognize fully the local governments as full-scale partner. That's it. Thank you. That was in a, in a nutshell. Thank you, Sam. Thank you, Maimuna. <laughs> <Thank you so. laughs> So as we have seen, uh, smart cities are at the forefront of change. Um, and Chesta has put uh, the topic really also high on the agenda and you underlined it now, it, it needs to be even higher. So we are just at the beginning of the conversation. We will talk over and over again um, this topic. And um, actually the Chesta summit uh, will take place again in August, 2022 where we will um, include the findings of the first JESTA summit and also of a worldwide global consultation on the JESTA um, breakthrough radar, sorry, <laughs> I almost forgot the most important instrument. So, um, but before going into the future, let us take a step back now, of course, to the present, but also let's have a look how it is two pre previous two days look like? What did we experience? What did we learn? Some impressions.
So not only is the future full of, en full of engineering complexity, anticipating it means also engaging more and more stakeholder, broadening the role of participation, we have just heard it. And this is why um, we will now look back at the first Chester Summit, reflect on what we have learned, what we have seen, what we have heard. Um, and for this reporting session, we have with us uh, three students, and I would like to introduce you to the moderator of the session, to David Goodhart. He's a journalist, author, and think tanker. So the floor is yours, David. Thank you very much. Uh, yeah, I'm your kind of sub-moderator for this, um, uh, the next section of this closing session. Um, and um, as was just said, I'm, I'm, I'm going to moderate a conversation with some real young people who we've just rounded up um, to get some reaction. Uh, they have actually been following what's been happening over the last couple of days, and we're going to get some reaction from them. So let me uh, let me just introduce them. They are all under twenty five. No, technically they're either twenty five or under. Um, um, we have closer to me uh, from America is Joe Maggiore, who is a PhD student in medicine integrative systems biology at the University of Pittsburgh. Um, next to Joe is Keshav Khanna, who is from India, but he's studying, he's doing a master's in international affairs from the Graduate Institute of International and Development Studies here in Geneva. And um, to um, Keshav's left is Hannah Tickle, who is both British and Swiss, interesting combination. Um, and is doing a master's in social and organizational psychology at the LSE in London. Um, so I'm, I'm gonna start um, with Joe as he's closest to me. I mean, basically just what, what have you, what's, what is your feeling? How have you reacted to what you've heard in the last couple of days? What, what seemed most relevant to you? Perhaps most, what was most problematic in what you've heard? Yeah, I mean, I'll Initially, there are a million things to come that come to mind. I think, you know, first of all, I just feel so grateful to be here, especially because as I'm looking around, there are not that many people that are my age and our age. And I think at first it was almost a little overwhelming because we're talking about these problems that are five, 10, 25 years in the future. But for me thinking about this, that's 30, being 30 years old, 35 and 50 years old, which I hope to be is not that old. And I, I'm sure you guys would agree as well. And I think it's almost overwhelming because there's like, there's, there's so much that needs to be done with these things. And, and we are the people that are really going to be responsible for these. And as a tissue engineer and, you know, confronting genetic engineering questions, I think I've, hearing a lot of these sessions, when it came to the science, I felt very confident about, you know, what is the right way to move forward with a lot of these scientific questions. But I think it's just quite frankly shocking that, you know, me being in this place of privilege with the education that I'm receiving, I'm a third year graduate student in the US. And this is the first time that I've ever heard the word multilateralism. So I think that that should be shocking and I think that it really speaks to how incredible of an opportunity Jezda has in that if we really want to create this future that we're talking about, I think it's just unbelievable that yesterday with the announcement of these training programs for graduate students and the public, I think that it's a really powerful way that, you know, as a, as a scientist that wants to create global change, I think I would feel really confident having that kind of diplomacy training. And I think it's a necessary part for the success of JESDA and our future. Mm, thanks. Um, Keshav, um, as a student of international affairs, I assume you have heard of the concept of multilateralism. <laughs> hey, uh, <laughs> don't, unfortunately, yes. yeah. don't take me. Um, um, but I wonder whether you, um, yeah, you do, do you have any thoughts about, you know, how to build more voices into the, 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 the science, the global science conversation? 
Absolutely. And um, I just want to echo what um, um, Joe said that it's, it's incredible to be here, to, be, to have this sort of opportunity. Um, being surrounded by so many diplomats, this is like Comic-Con to me. It's, I'm just so happy to be in this space. The, the, the younger people in the audience laughed, so I'm, I'm good. <laughs> Um, but um, yeah, it's, it's, it's fantastic to have this sort of environment where um, not only as, as young people, we can learn from uh, everybody and their years and years of expertise, uh, but also sort of understand the applications that are, that are possible for um, uh, advancing technologies. Um, I have attended a lot of very interesting sessions here. I've attended sessions on multilateralism. Sorry, Joe. <laughs> I've attended uh, sessions on um, the advancing AI, quantum technology, things like that. And um, my biggest takeaway has been that uh, what we're doing with science is incredible and the sort of progress we're making is, is fasc fascinating. Um, but my concern in that regard is that what happens when our international institutions of governance fail to keep up or if they're not able to keep up, they're not, just not designed to keep up with it. And this reminds me of a session from yesterday where um, this, this gentleman was talking about the G20 and G7. And he said that G20 and G7 are designed explicitly to solve the problems of today. So then who's thinking about the problems of tomorrow? And with, with that, I, I feel Jezda is a fast, fantastic platform for that sort of thing, because you're thinking 5, 10, 25 years in the future, and you're trying to solve problems before they even happen. Um, I, I honestly, sincerely wish that that is coupled with the sort of political reform we need in not just domestic context, but also international institutions. And uh, we're able to bring these two things together and, and make real difference. Thanks. Um, Hannah, we were, um, you're a social psychologist, but we, we were talking earlier about um, the fact that obviously younger people tend to be the the group in society who are most interested of all in in the issues of climate change and geoengineering and so on um perhaps rather than issues connected to longevity because you're all going to live forever anyway um, um but i wonder whether you yeah you, know, you you have any reflections on 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 perhaps on that issue um, or anything else yeah <laughs> um so i'd like to first of all echo um joe and keshav's uh gratefulness for having this opportunity to be here and be surrounded by such high caliber people um, and I feel quite humbled to um, act as a kind of youth representative with everyone here um, and I'd first of all like to just make a general remark on this summit is that it's very refreshing to see older generations uh, think about our future and not only think about more short-term consequences um, in terms of governance and science. Um, and in terms of key takeaways, the two things which stand out for me, which probably connect to my background in social science, is the act of translation between science and the more general public. I think it's something for a very long time which has not been taken seriously enough and people have potentially stayed in more smaller circles and it's important to use a more accessible vocabulary and on that note i would like to also add that inclusion and accessibility for example at the session yesterday on inclusive growth um, translation is going to be very important in order to include people also from diverse locations, but also age groups and educational backgrounds in order to just make sure everybody's included in the conversation. And I think that's probably one of the key takeaways uh, from the discussions we've been having in terms of being able to really share and listen in an accessible way. Thank you. <laughs> uh, I mean, it's obviously a bit artificial to, to kind of to make you represent your generation. Um, but nonetheless, I mean, I, I think there are a few things that are, that are common to perhaps all three of you, or, or to your generation at least, which is when young people tend to have less trust in authority than older people. And you know, when we're talking about consensus building and bringing more voices into, um, into the debate about uh, the, the science problems of the future, you know, we do need, we need trust. Um, and, and I think the other issue we were talking about this earlier is that 
kind of there is no such thing as society. I mean, you know, uh, Jean-Jacques Rousseau, who comes from Geneva, um, uh, you know, invented this uh, rather rather um, nebulous concept of the general will. And we kind of apply that, you know, when, I mean, I've heard it in many conversations when we're talking about, say, human enhancement, people are always saying, oh, well, you know, society must intervene to, to stop this or do this or do that. There is no such thing as society in that simple way, at least, you know, in liberal societies, we have huge value divergences, huge differences of opinion. I mean, how do, how do we... How do we create that consensus? You, you, you had some thoughts on this. I think. Yeah, I mean, I think from, you know, I, I think that there's a, I think you're 100% right, that there tends to be, at least, you know, in my circle of life, that there can be this kind of like distrust of an older generation that has a lot of wisdom to be gained. And I think what I see in that is that if, that there's an intense distrust when there's not an acknowledgement from leaders of really what is going on in a situation. So I think, for example, you know, I think there were a couple times in, in observing what was going on here where there was an acknowledgement that maybe, you know, an evil path of a technology development, there will always be people that maybe are going to want to do that. And, you know, some people just want to see the world burn and elements like that. And I think to me, I feel like the biggest power is in acknowledging that these forces may exist and acknowledging these boundaries and that Jezda may be in a situation where we can provide incentives for good behavior and that we should acknowledge that, yeah, we can all talk about a lot of these things, but how can we get academics and industry members to be excited about creating global diplomacy? The reality of it may be that they're not that interested and mm -hmm. having Jezda play a role in incentivizing that, whether it's through a stamp of approval for companies with this advocacy or what, but. Mm. Well, very quickly, I mean, perhaps final thoughts from, from um, Keshav and Hannah. I mean, perhaps particularly, the, I mean, the whole question, again, it came to, you know, we talk globally about consensus building, but you know, that, well, there are massive differences of interest between nations. There are massive differences of interest between you know, rich countries in the global south. And you know, we've seen that in the, in the COVID crisis, uh, that you know, we're, we're not coming together and behaving globally, and perhaps we never will. I mean, quick thoughts. Absolutely, I, I feel um, that's, that's where things get very tricky because um, the, the difference between sort of looking at things in an idealistic lens is that you miss the practical, realist, the, the, the things that are happening on the ground. And, because of that, um, we're seeing that in many ways, science is sort of splintering again in, in two blocks in global politics. And what might that result in? I mean, we, 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 would we return to the sort of Cold War science development only for the, for the benefit of geopolitical advances, uh, where certain science is just not looked at because it's not advantageous in the geopolitical scale? So what I worry about personally is that what, will we continue to invest in science for the sake of it, because it's for the benefit of everybody, like let's say for pandemic sciences, health sciences, or will we return to this era of, of competition where we are developing science for getting an edge over a competitor in global sense? But I also want to talk about the trust issue that you mentioned, which is very important because not just in our generation, but in, in our societies that we're coming from, we see that Trust has been broken in science, in governance institutions, and that is resulting in catastrophic difficulties in trying to get people vaccinated or trying to stop some sort of conflict uh, within societies. And um, I'm, I'm very curious to see what sort of um, solutions Jezda can, can bring to the table for that and how they can sort of assist different nation states, different community actors in building a more coherent um, trust um, through, through confidence building measures in our societies. Thanks. No, I mean, one of the ideas that has been raised is actually having a JEST uh, Youth Advisory Board. Um, Hannah, a final word from you on w whether, you would, whether you would sit on such an advisory board, if, if chosen. Why yeah. not? <laughs> <laughs> Why not? Um, but I, I think I mean, from a social scientist perspective, uh, they should definitely be that kind of representation. Uh, I mean, you mentioned two very important points, um, which are trust and building consensus. I mean, we, ha we live in such a fragment fragmented 
um, time, and it's going to be important to bring people together to understand what we can agree on with, and what are the main challenges. I mean, you were asking earlier about climate change. I don't think that is going to be, in the coming years, one of the biggest challenges to face, especially with a lack of trust in science and governments alike. Um, so I'm looking forward to see how um, we can work on it. Well, thank you very much. And, and thank you. But so stay here for a moment, because I'm going to introduce to the stage um, a local rock star, Didier, Didier Kello, um, a Swiss astronomer, Nobel Prize winner, um, Cambridge and ETH Zurich, um, uh, who did all his key work when he was under 30. Um, so I just wondered if you had any, any, any thoughts that um, you wanted to bounce off uh, the youth section. No. Yeah, yes. It's working, yeah. Well, thank you for the nice introduction. <laughs> <laughs> I promise I won't sing. Um, <laughs> the, well, my advice is always the same. I mean, I know when you see all these old people that are going awarded the Nobel Prize, just remind yourself always the time when they made the discoveries, they were very close to their 30s. So, so I keep saying to everybody when they ask me, what is the advice you're giving to young people? Well, I just say exactly the same. You are the blood of the science. Don't forget it. So never being told what to do, just do it. <laughs> You'll go now. No more youth. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> you tell me when I start. Should I do something? Should I click? Okay, I'm just watching. Okay, great. Right, here we are. Okay. Well, thank you for the very kind invitation. So actually, I'm not coming from very far because I'm, I'm, I'm born in that country. In, I'm born in that city. So, so actually, I was spending a couple of days here in Geneva. So that was really nice for me to come along. Um, I would like to share with you something that we're doing in the science that I think may reflect on some of the ideas that you have been talking about during, um, during these three days. Um, it's, the, it's dealing with very profound questions into science, and I'm, I'm picking one because that's one which is very uh, dear to my activity right now, is the question of the origin of life. So um, if you think about science, if you think about knowledge, I think you would, as a scientist, can identify yourself almost along these three topics. So either you're dealing with matter, either you're dealing with life, or you're dealing with consciousness. And I think if you think about these three topics, you would realize that they are still, at, as a fundamental level, key questions. Mm -hmm. Frankly, even the matter, when you believe we have an amazing understanding of the matter right now with what we're doing, well, actually, we have to face the very amazing and embarrassing reality as a physicist that most of the universe, we have no idea what it is made of right now. If you think about life, that's true. You're curing disease. You, we have an amazing understanding of the working mechanism of life. But do we understand anything about the origin of life? And of course, consciousness is certainly what's the most profound element here. So if you're asking, what do we know about this? Well, the answer is very simple, not very much, actually. And, uh, and I, I would like to spend a bit more time talking about life because I think there is something going on right now. There is a kind of a paradigm uh, shift here. If you address this very simple question in a way, very generic question, see how do we, all life can start on Earth, the life as we know it as of today. What can we say about other life in the universe? This includes the solar systems. And, can we know something about the nature of life? Is life always made exactly the very same? I think this kind of topic that seems a bit extravagant, close to sci-fi, and actually they are being really seriously thought about right now, and we are making tremendous progress. So I'm, I'm taking a bet here that this century is a century where there will be massive changes and massive um, gain of knowledge on that topic. Uh, Similarly, then if you look back to the previous centuries, main achievement was done on understanding the matter. When you think what we understood in the end of the 19th century, 
you see that one of the most visible achievements, so we are able to reproduce, unfortunately on Earth, what is going on in the sun with the thermonuclear power. And uh, we may end up this century to be able to make life from scratch with a lot of um, interesting questions and fascinating social society impact that, that it is driving to. Why do we do that? Well, for simple reason. First, this is the Earth through time at the various stage of the formations of the Earth. So when you start on the bottom, you have this very early stage when you bring all the material together, you start to make the Earth, the, the Earth is cooling down. There is a very complex evolution, so geophysical evolution at that time, but these this geophysical evolutions at some point turn out to be the location where you have the beginning of life on Earth. So this is a global, I think, development here that you can reflect and study when you do see a planet on, uh, on another star, actually you do study the atmosphere of this planet. And it's a bit of a complicated diagram, but I show you three different stage corresponding to three different stage that we have here on this picture that is reflecting different atmosphere you're getting. So it's not just the idea that there may be other planets made differently. We can trace this down remotely. We can study the systems. and. Plenty of big questions. I mean, why, why do you have so much oxygen at some point? We know it's because of life, but why exactly was the consequence of that? Because it's cooled down the earth. There's a lot, lot of very interesting effect that is getting, um, that you can study there. So on the top of that, what is going to happen in the first half a billion years, there is the building up of life. And if you want to simplify the concept, I mean, you have to start from scratch, essentially what you have, and you have to build up the complexity. This is just an idea of the complexity building you ended up until you have something that would qualify of being alive. We know very little of that, but tremendous progress of being done these days in lab in combination to what we start learning on other planets. Well, the obvious origin of life mechanism that we have some idea about is when you have the conditions uh, on, on Earth with enough water, enough volcanic activity, enough of infall of comet bringing you the cyanidric acid. It's not the most obvious gas you may, you may think about for the age of life. And a lot of UV radiation from, from the sun, you're doing a very fascinating chemistry. And not so long ago, there has been a couple of work. This is one of the very famous first one in 2015 that maybe eventually will, will be subject for a Nobel Prize in 10 to 15 years, developing a first set of chemical reaction, a biochemistry reaction that establishing the foundations of the origin of life. In that case, this is to produce the 20 amino acid, which is being used by, by life. So what is fascinating on that is we can test it. We can test it in very different way, which is a big change because science is not about ideas. It's about facts, it's about data. So what if, when you think you, you pretend you have to test it at some point here. We are on Mars right now. We have a robot right now, which is sitting right in the middle of this location here you have. Well, you don't need to be a geo geophysicist to understand that you recognize the kind of structure. This is a delta. It's a delta of a river. So this is what Mars looked like. If you go back in time, quite a lot, actually, three billion years ago. But what is fascinating, if you take the first billion, billion years on Mars, this is exactly the time when you start life on Earth. So there is a serious hint that we're going to see some fascinating chemistry which is related to the origin of life. But the gift is Mars stopped evolu uh, its evolution as a planet, and it's almost the same. The problem with Earth is Earth continued this evolution, and we have no clue exactly what was like the Earth at that time, but we have it on Mars. This is why we're so eager to bring back rocks. Now, you may expect tremendous change of concept and think about maybe finding that there has been some life on, on Mars uh, and the life would be different or the same about the chemistry you had you thinking for life on Earth. This is going to happen. This is for the next 15 years. This is really tomorrow in terms of science here. Now, the other big revolutions which related to my work, we know there are planets everywhere right now. We move from non-planet to other stars to plenty. I think it's, it has been a massive revolution for astrophysics. Uh, and then of course, the obvious question you have is such an immense number of planets. You have to ask the question, what does it mean for life? And do we have life on this planet? And it comes along and along every time. And I think this is very central right now to our topic to find out what 
we understand our life. Now, the clue here is using this kind of idea I explained to you about what is the atmosphere of a planet and trying to study that. I just show you as an example on the right in different wavelengths in the infrared, what is the impact of a very specific effect that we believe have an impact on the formation of life. So there is traces, anything that happened, big volcanic event, big impact, change of the atmosphere, makes something on the planet. There is an imprint and we can look for that. So looking for life on other planet is not just looking for ET radio, it's just looking for the imprint of life that could be a different stage of the life evolution. So we are going to open up, similarly that we moved from one planetary system to know many, we may end up having a complete understanding of the diversity of life or not. And that will be happening. This is going to happen in this century. Um, now, the challenge here, and I think this is the relevant element for this, um, for this debate here, is to make it work, you already understand that we have to bring a couple of disciplines together. Well, chemistry, biochemistry, geophysics, physics, and a lot of technology. I didn't show you all this idea of big telescopes that we are dreaming about flying and having on the on, on the moon. There will be very soon a launch of the James Webb Space Telescope. We're very eager about that. So it's all a lot of disciplines together. Well, what you realize when you start embarking into this topic, the main problem is the lack of bridges between these disciplines to make them work. It's impossible for an astrophysicist to understand life if you don't have a biologist. Well, try to explain astrophysics to a biologist. Try to do experiment between biology, chemistry, and physics. In my own experience, we're having a lot of fun right now with this kind of joint experiment. We, there's something in physics that we call error bars. We love error bars and statistics. Well, when you talk to a chemist, uh, they can look at you like that. What are you talking about? And there's not no idea what it is. So, so there's a lot, lot of jargon, a lot of language definition here that we have to go to. And it turns out it is not the topic which has limited the progress. It's the structure of the way the topic is being organized. And it goes even further than that, is the communication channel between disciplines are difficult because the way science is being organized is the same it was in the Victorian age. We have not made very much progress. Look at the universities, they still organize the same way. It's very difficult to implement joint lettership or joint program or joint PhD. Try to make a proposal that brings physicists and chemists at the same time Either one part of the panel of the physicists will tell you the physics is not good enough, or the panel of the chemists will tell you the chemistry is not good enough. You will never get it because they expect this very targeted kind of science. I think this program can certainly be replicated to other kind of topic, but that's one is the one I'm in, and this is the one I'm dealing with. But the most interesting aspect as well that I start discovering with that is what I call the philosophical preconceptions. When you do science, you embed into your science program, your social background, your language, your educations, and the global perceptions about who you have to reflect into the society. It's even more profound for some topics which are, I mean, directly controversial, like uh, when you deal with genetics or that. But even when you're dealing with life, you're entering into fascinating debate, and you can think you cannot do science without bringing this in the game. This is absolutely heretic, what I'm telling you right now. It means bringing heart and humanities with hardcore sciences. We barely start to bring the core, the heart solid science into what is qualified as soft science, that's the social sciences. It starts getting together slowly, but moving to the art and humanities, it's still a bigger bridge. But actually we may have to do that as well. And of course, when you do that, it's not the lack of interest of the researcher. It's the lack of interest to make a change into the structure of the science. I'm talking here for people that's part of the uh, national agencies that are sponsoring science and foundations. So we all can do something here, but we know they're going to just fix that in one day, but we should try to understand that the future of the science is not anymore in these many silos of disciplines. We have to bring back something that is from the time of the 17th centuries. Well, you can look at Leonardo da Vinci, for example. He was a painter an engineer and a physicist. Well, no big deal at that time. Well, why not trying to implement this in terms of structural 
design into the science. We don't have to build the science entirely on that, but bringing a lot of more flexibility. So I think some kind of polymath skill and training will be needed. And if I want to give you a very short message uh, for this assembly, I think this topic of the life in the universe, we're going to organize ourselves. We're setting up a center, Rhino and ATH Zurich. We're setting up center in Cambridge. Similarly, for is going on on the other Cambridge of the Atlantic. Princeton is doing the same, the Carnegie institutions, there's a lot, a lot of big moves right now in this because they all understand. But I think we should really think more global here and maybe use the same kind of idea on other topics to embark in a more global uh, a program here. I thank you for your attention. Hello. <laughs> You need to stay a bit longer. Thank you very much for your very fascinating um, talk. Um, well, mind blowing. I mean, thinking um, and researching on life, the beginnings of life. So you mentioned it in your talks. It's already for scientists, very difficult to work transversal together and understand what are the other scientists doing in their fields. And we also heard it today, we need to build bridges to explain science also to a broader public, but also in, in light that even scientists sometimes don't understand what the others are doing. How can we achieve to explain what is happening within the science and research to a more broader public? Yeah. Well, that's a, that's a vast question, <laughs> but I, I believe science is an organic body. I don't think can direct science. So any program that tends to be direct is going to fail in science. And there is a couple of massive failure when program too much directed led to absolute catastrophe. So science is closer to artistic in terms of if you've got a pure energy. So let the science do the science. Keep them doing the science. So anything you would do should keep that in mind. So my, my first message, let them doing what they need to do. Stop telling them what to do. Stop bringing, I mean, limitation or red tapes and, and all this admin limitation you bring to the scientists. Just ask them what they want to do. And there is something that is related to the second part of the question is what about the society? Well, we all part of the society and uh, we all feel that we are fortunate uh, as very educated people, especially this, this audience, which is, which is amazingly educated. Um, I think the more educated you are, the more you feel, feel responsible for your educations and the more you should give back time to the society. And this is something we can do way better, much, much better. I know when I'm talking sometimes to the private industries, they say we're paying enough tax, so we, I don't see why we should do better. Well, you should do better because if you stop, if you keep disconnecting from the society, sooner or later, society will come back to you and that will be really bad what's going to happen. And we see already a little bit the problem of the disconnection between the science of the knowledge and the society. And I think this is something we should respect. And that's not something which is discarded by seeing all these people they don't know what they're talking about. I think these people, they are talking about something that they feel it's important for them. And I think as a scientist, as an educated person, as a responsible for institutions, we don't do enough. We never do enough, and we should really acknowledge that. It means maybe all the entities which is spreading knowledge and funding knowledge should consider having way more effort. And that goes to the social science, that goes to understanding the psychology of the society into this topic. And we can do way more because frankly, I don't think we do very much right now. Thank you very much, Didier Cologne. So as you have seen, complexity can be found in cities, but also in space. Understanding and anticipating this complexity is critical for addressing our needs as a society. Chesta has done a tremendous job of putting the scale and scope of this complexity on our radar and elevating discussions of it all the way from the origins of life to space. Now we will hear, we are coming to the end of the session and we will hear in a second the final closing word by Chester President Peter Brabeck. But just some words on logistics. Um, I think we are, or you are all hungry probably. Um, lunch will be served just um, right after this session. 
then please don't forget to bring your badge uh, back to the reception. And for those going to CERN, um, be at 2 p.m. at the entrance. Also for those who will attend the stage reading, can AI create art pieces? And with that, I just can say thank you all very much for being part of this great adventure, of being part of the first ever um, Geneva Science and Global, Global Geneva Science Anticipation. Sorry, again. <laughs> Geneva Science and Diplomacy Anticipation Summit ever. And with that, I would like to welcome um, JESTA President uh, Peter Brabeck to the stage. Well, ladies and gentlemen, we are arriving at the end of three days, I think, of very intensive days of discussions, of explanations, and of propositions. I think we can say the agenda is exhausted, and perhaps some of us, we are also exhausted. Let me thank you the over 900 active participants, and I would like to stress specifically also the students, not only those who were just with us on the things, but also the other students who have been with us during the three days and participating actively. From uh, all over the world, we had participation really from all over the world and the impact we, you might see it afterwards, we had a look into what has happening on the social media worldwide. It had an impact worldwide because of this participation worldwide. Uh, we had an invaluable input. We had creative and motivating comments and messages. And they were full of knowledge and of wisdom. And all with, from my side, highly appreciated intention to help Shasta to find its way into the future. We listened to 116 speakers from 32 countries under the guidance of fantastic moderators. I always say the quality of the panel depends on the moderators. And as the quality was so high, so the moderators were extremely high. And we profited from the wealth of their knowledge and their foresight and their anticipation. The base for all of our discussion was the first science breakthrough radar, which itself is a result of the intensive work of our scientific forum under the leadership of Joel Maison and Martin Fetterly. I don't know whether you have had the time to read it, but I'm sure you will read it. For me, important thing is that it has been signed by 543 scientists. This document is a matter of credibility, extremely important, the signature of those signs, because it certifies that what we are putting in there has been checked and is the reflection of the reality of what is happening. And not only do we have the opinion and the I would say the, the, the analysis of what is being cooking in the laboratories, but we also have in this radar the scientific opinion of what those breakthroughs will bring to our daily life in the next five, 10, or 25 years. A document I'm sure that will be of interest not only to the scientific community, I'm sure universities, but also believe that policymakers should have a deep look into this document and also private corporations. If I was in charge of the research institute at the private company, believe me, I would look into this document because it will show me where the real breakthroughs will come through. The first qualitative comments which accompany the radar are the results of these confrontations that we had during the last year between the scientific and the diplomacy forum, the later one uh, presided so efficiently by Michael Muller, in which uh, 
what we have called the situation room, we have for the first time really made a confrontation and the situation room offers a constructive environment for those encounters of communities which have a quite different language as we have heard just in the last presentation, but also a different agenda and different interests. But all of this, ladies and gentlemen, would not have happened without our outstanding, small, but highly professional team under the leadership of our Secretary General, Stephen de Couture, and with the guidance of our deeply engaged board of directors, all of which have participated in the different panels during those three days. So to all of you, my very warm thanks for your engagement in favor of Shesta. The objective of this first summit was for the first time to offer to the public a presentation of what Chester is, but also, I hope, what Chester is not, which is for me as important than what Chester is. And for that purpose, we presented you our first breakthrough radar, created a situation room. Many times I'm being asked, what is a situation room? Well, situation room is a process which allows this confrontation between science and diplomacy and politics. And the summit itself was a situation room. You were sitting in a situation room. You were participating in this situation room. That's what we are doing the year long, confronting, discussing, and understanding better those different problems. So we explained the basics of our policy of partnership. I think I was quite clear that I see different partnerships which are available for those who are interested to work with us. And we wanted to hear from you whether Chester could be relevant for all stakeholders interested in scientific diplomacy and multiculturalism. From what I have heard from all of you, I would be arrogant to deduct that we have received a clear yes from you. Yes, Chester can be and should be relevant for all stakeholders. But I know also very well that the relevancy will only last as long as you have trust in our work. Trust in Chester as an honest broker, which works fact-based, transparent, and inclusive. Those are the fundamental conditions under which Chester can perform its duty as a builder of bridges. We, we heard this all days long. And I think it's a duty for Chester to become a builder of bridges between the scientists and the politics, but also with the involvement of the civil communities from all over the world and in the respect of cultural diversity. So what can you expect from Chester in a year by now? Well, first of all, as we had pointed out, the science radar is a rolling forecasting what's happening. So next year you should receive the second science breakthrough radar. Some of it will be what we have here. Some of it might have dropped out and some of it hopefully will come in new because as we were saying, the speed with which science develops is enormous and accelerating. So this document can only be valid, relevant and trustful if we updated it all the time. The second one is, you will see in the coming month, an increased work of the situation room. As I said, the starting point is the input that we have received from all of you. This will go now 
together with all the input, input which is coming on the digital platform, this will go now into the situation rooms in this confrontation between the science and uh, diplomacy. And uh, I'm hopeful that uh, by next year, we will be able to present you two, maximum, I think, three solutions. That would be the next step for JESTA. And I put these expectations clear out. We cannot credibly be the answer to all the problems that they, are, they have been discussing. We have to be very clear that by limiting our expectations, we might stay more trustful and relevant. So our expectations is let's hopefully find two or three solutions for next year that we can present, that we can discuss. And then afterwards, hopefully we can also strengthen and widen during this coming year, our partnerships. So that perhaps next year, together with the solutions, we can already bring new partners into our work that then would be the ones who are going to work with the guidance of JESTA and the implementation of these things. JESTA is a Swiss founded foundation. And during next year, we will have to talk to our founders whom you all have met from the Swiss government to the government of Canton and the city of, of, of Geneva. We have to talk to them and to convince them that Chesta can have a life after the first three years, which were given to us when we started Chesta. Chesta is Geneva based. And I consider personally that our founders are very important for the, for the credibility of our work. And Geneva is the right place to do it for all the reasons we have heard during all those days. But at the same time, I also have to tell our founders that they don't forget that Geneva, uh, that Chester is an open worldwide institution working for all people of this world. So yes, Geneva based, but with an impact and solutions that are for the world. Now, thanks to this overwhelming quality of your participation, I have little doubt that our founders will wholeheartedly support the future of Chester. So thank you to all of you very much for those impressive participation you have had during those days. And let's use together the future to build a better present. Thank you very much. <laughs>